Welcome to lecture four of module seven. This is our second lecture on the factorization method and how we solve quantum algebraically. We're going to be focusing on two concrete examples of how we apply the factorization method. So let me remind you graphically how we solve these problems. So we start off with a Hamiltonian H0. That's the Hamiltonian we're interested in solving. We use a construction that then gives us a set of auxiliary Hamiltonians that we call H1, H2, H3, and so on. For each one of those Hamiltonians, we find the ground state. So we have the ground state of our initial problem. That comes from a subsidiary condition of A0 acting on psi 0 equals 0. And we get similar ground states for each of our auxiliary Hamiltonians. Phi 1 satisfies A1 hat acting on phi 1 equals 0 and so forth. Then we get the first excited states of each of those, the true Hamiltonian and each of the auxiliary Hamiltonians by applying the appropriate operator onto the auxiliary Hamiltonian ground state. So for the first excited state, it's A0 dagger. The next one is an A1 dagger and an A2 dagger and an A3 dagger. You can clearly see that pattern. Then to get the second excited state, we bring in the operator with an index one value less than the one that we just put in. And then to get the third excited state and then the fourth excited state. And if you look at this, you can see that for the Hamiltonian, the original one of interest that we're solving, those wave functions, psi1, psi2, psi3, psi4, they all share a similar pattern. They all start with an A0 dagger. They go all the way up to an N minus one and they operate on the phi N. And that's the way that those operators are created. Now I do wanna just talk a little bit again about how we actually construct the auxiliary Hamiltonians. From the H0, we construct the auxiliary Hamiltonian H1 by looking at the raising and lowering operators multiplied together in the opposite order. And then we do a refactorization to determine the A1 and A1 dagger, and also to determine the energy, the E1. Remember in our rules, we cannot choose A1 equals A0 dagger. So we ha actually have to do a refactorization, otherwise the procedure does not work. And then we do the same thing for the H2, it's an A1, A1 dagger plus E1, which we just change the order of the operators. The H3 is an A2, A2 dagger plus E2 and so forth. And then in all those cases, we have to do a refactorization. And the challenging part comes about, of course, in doing the refactorization. When we have a potential called a shape-preserving potential, then we have a simple procedure by which we can do that factorization. And then I just want to finally remind you that the states that I wrote down here are not the normalized states. They're just proportional to the normalized eigenstates. And we had a homework problem where we actually figured out what the normalization factor was. Let's go through our simplest example of the factorization method, the simple harmonic oscillator. But let's now do it in this Schrodinger methodology with the, the Schrodinger way or Schrodinger uh, approach for how we're gonna do the factorization. So the first thing that we have to do is looking at this Hamiltonian is we have to construct our ladder operators. Now the strategy for forming the ladder operator in its generic form is one over square root of two m momentum minus i h bar k zero w of k zero prime x hat w is the super potential the super potential satisfies a property that's going to be very important in determining how we get this raising and lowering operator but before going that i just want to talk about some strategies about how you proceed so we know that we're gonna be constructing the Hamiltonian from an A0 dagger A0. And when we calculate that, we get one term that's gonna involve the square of the superpotential. And we're gonna get one term that involves the commutator of the superpotential with momentum. Now, if we think about how that would work, if I wanna get a final potential that is an X squared, and I know that I'm allowed to add any constant onto that, then picking the superpotential proportional to x is a natural, because if I pick the superpotential proportional to x, when I square it, I get x squared. And when I take the commutator with p, I get a number. And as long as the a0 dagger a0 is equal to the Hamiltonian plus some number, 
then I'm okay as long as that number has the right sign and has the right behavior that's consistent with the eigenvalues of the problem that we're trying to solve. And we'll see a little bit more about that in just a moment. But now we didn't say this when we did it the first time. We just gave you a, a raising and lowering operator and essentially said, you know, show that this works. We hit something under the rug. You know, the simplest choice is linear, but we really have two choices here. We can pick p hat minus i m omega x hat or p hat plus i m omega x hat. Now, in the first case, the superpotential is proportional to x. In the second case, it's proportional to minus x. Now, we have a rule that's a very important rule when we're doing the factorization method. And that is that in one dimension, the superpotential must be positive as x goes to infinity positive infinity, and it must be negative as x goes to negative infinity. So then that tells us we clearly need to pick the choice on the left. The one on the right has the wrong sign for the superpotential. And the reason why that sign is so important is if we pick the right sign, we get a result that is decaying as we go out to infinity. If we pick the wrong result, we get a result that grows exponentially or worse as we go to infinity. And the wave functions have to be bounded. So we can't have something that blows up and goes to infinity as our coordinate goes to infinity. So the right choice is the one with the minus sign. And that's just by following this rule about the sign of the superpotential as x goes to plus or minus infinity. All right, let's work it out. Let's calculate a0, a0 dagger. We find that the Hamiltonian will equal a0 dagger a0 plus e0 when we go through this. We've gone through this algebra before. And the e0 is equal to 1 half h bar omega. If you're a little bit rusty about how that works, of course, when I look at the a0 dagger a0, I'll get a p squared term. I'll get the commutator of p with minus i m omega x hat. When I calculate that, com the commutator of p with x hat is minus i h bar. And that's going to give me a, when all the dust settles, a minus h bar omega over 2. That's going to equal minus e0. And then the squared term is giving me an m squared omega squared x squared divided by 2m. And that's going to give the 1 half m omega squared x squared. Okay, so we've gone through that algebra before. I'm not writing it out in great detail for you here. But now we want to compute the next term. Okay, remember h1 is a0, a0 dagger plus e0. I have them in the opposite order. Now, the easiest way to write this is to use our add zero trick. We're going to add and subtract an a0 dagger a0. We're going to group the a0 dagger a0 plus e0. That's our h0. And then we're left with a commutator of a0 with a0 dagger. We substitute in what the a0 and a0 dagger are. I get a factor of 1 over 2m. I get a p commutator with i m omega x hat. And I get a minus i m omega x hat commutator with p. When you work out those commutators, because commutator p with x hat is minus i h bar, you see that term is going to give me an h bar m omega over 2m. And so that's just h bar omega divided by 2. I get the exact same result with the second commutator because it has a minus sign in front of it. And the commutator of x hat with p hat is i h bar. And so the net, when I add both of those together, is a plus h bar omega. And so that's what h1 hat is. Now the factorization is simple. I actually use the same a0. a1 is equal to a0. Note this does not violate our rule. Our rule was that a1 could not equal a0 dagger. And indeed, it does not equal a0 dagger. But it equaling a0 is allowed. However, I should caution you, this is the only case in factorization where the raising operators and lowering operators are the same for each index n. And then the energy, because we have this extra factor of h bar omega, is 3 halves h bar omega. Now we can do the same thing for a2. We find that a2 is equal to a0, and the energy will be 5 halves h bar omega, because we've got another h bar omega that we have to add together. And then the general case is going to be that an is equal to a0, and the energy is 2n plus 1 divided by 2 times h bar omega, with hn equal to h0 plus n h bar omega. What about the states? Remember, the states satisfy a0 dagger up to a dagger n minus 1 acting on phi n. But remember, all of those a sub i's are equal to a sub 0. So I can replace all of those a daggers by a0, and I have n of them. 
So it actually becomes a0 dagger raised to the nth power acting on the state phi n. Remember, phi n is also a state that's independent of n. It's actually the ground state because the subsidiary condition is the same for every one of these auxiliary Hamiltonians because the a0 is the lowering operator in every case. And so this actually has exactly the same form as the ground states that we found earlier when we did our direct fa factorization and we worked with the raising and lowering operators in the Dirac form of the notation. And finally, we have a normalization we have to calculate. So remember the normalization factor is one over the, over the square root of en minus e0 times en minus e1 all the way out to en minus en minus 1. Now if you look at the energies, you can immediately figure out that en minus e0, that's just equal to n times h bar omega. En minus E1, that's N minus 1 times H bar omega. And it goes all the way out to H bar omega for the last term. So when we put all of that together, we can factor out N factors of 1 over the square root of H bar omega. And we're left with N times N minus 1 times N minus 2 all the way down to 1. That's just 1 over the square root of N factorial. And then this is the proper normalization. Now, don't get concerned that there's this factor of 1 over H bar omega to the N over 2 power. That was actually the extra factor that we had when we converted from the Schrodinger form of the ladder operators to the Dirac form. All right, so the simple harmonic oscillator solution is exactly the same as what we had before. We're going to now go into a second example. This one is actually one of the harder problems, if not the hardest problem, we're going to solve the entire semester in this class. And it is the particle in a box. This corresponds to a situation where we have a potential that's equal to infinity, and it's outside of the box, and it's equal to zero inside the box. And that means the particle always stays in the box. When we think about the wave function for this system, the wave function goes to zero at the edges because the wave function is continuous, and because the particle can never be outside the box, the wave function is equal to zero outside of the box. And so the boundary condition on this wave function is going to be that it's equal to zero at the edge of the box, both edges. But inside the box, the Hamiltonian is very simple. It's just p squared over 2m. We want to do a factorization. It seems like this is a really simple thing. Just choose the superpotential equal to zero. So my a is equal to p over the square root of 2m. But if we try this, then the racing and lowering operators commute with each other because P commutes with itself and there's no chain. Okay, so that actually ends up not working. It also gives us just one solution, the solution that has zero energy and it turns out that solution can't satisfy this boundary condition. So that one doesn't work for anything. It doesn't give us any solution that's a valid solution for this problem. All right, so we got to try harder. Another choice we can take is picking the super potential equal to a constant because of course the potential is equal to zero. So when I square that, I get a constant. And when I take the commutator, I get zero. And so that would equal the Hamiltonian plus a constant. But it turns out that won't work either because then when we calculate what the constant is, we find the constant is a positive constant. It's h bar squared k squared over 2m. Okay, why is that a problem? That means because when we calculate h, we find h is equal to a dagger k a k minus h bar squared k squared over 2m. That says my energy is negative. But the energy can't be negative. Look at that Hamiltonian. It's p squared. p is a Hermitian operator. I can write it as p dagger times p. That means its expectation value is the norm of a vector, norm squared of a vector. It must be greater than or equal to zero. It certainly can't have an energy that's less than zero. So this factorization that seemed like a good one also does not work. So now we have to really get hard in our thinking. If we go back and think about how we did this for particle in a circle, we can recognize we've already solved this problem essentially. What we pick is that a0 is 1 over the square root of 2m p hat plus i h bar k0 cotangent of k0 k hat. Now I've picked the k0 to be the same in both places. So we're gonna, when we expand this out, we're gonna get one over two m because the one over square of two m squared gives me one over two m. We get a p squared, we get a plus i h bar k zero times the commutator of p hat with this cotangent. You can see it's a plus sign there because I pick the w to be minus the cotangent. 
And then when I get the square term, it's plus h bar squared. That should be a k0 squared cotangent squared k0x. Okay? Now I have to calculate this commutator. Okay? So the commutator is going to be minus h bar squared k0 squared cosecant squared k0x. Okay? You might think, oh my God, how do I calculate that commutator? We actually did this when we were talking about particle in a box. We worked out this commutator. So you just have to go back to that video and look at how we did it to work out what that commutator is. And this is what the answer is. And now we have to think about, all right, look, I've got these terms. Remember that, that k is really a k0. That's just a typo there. And so what I have is minus cosecant squared. That's minus 1 over sine squared plus cotangent squared. That's cosine squared over sine squared. So I have minus 1 plus cosine squared. That's just minus sine squared in the numerator divided by sine squared. That just equals minus 1. So that whole thing equals a number. And indeed, you see I get a Hamiltonian, but now it's minus a number. And so that means that my E0 is going to be positive. So I get that it's A0 dagger A0 plus P squared over 2M minus H bar squared K0 squared over 2M. And that minus sign is critical in order to make it work because that means that my E0 is a positive number, as it has to be for this problem. And so we have an energy now that is going to be H bar squared K0 squared over 2M, and it's going to be greater than 0. All right, so we've done our first factorization. Now we have to work out how we get the second Hamiltonian. Oh, first we have to answer the question of how we choose k0. I'm sorry. All right, so remember I said that the wave function has to vanish at both edges of this particle in a box. And that's because we need the wave function to be continuous as we go through the system. And it has to be equal to 0 when the potential is infinity because the particle can never be found there. And Remember further that when the wave function is zero, because I can't have the wave function and the expectation value of the momentum equal to zero at the same time, when the wave function vanishes, the superpotential diverges. So I have to find a way for this cotangent to diverge at the boundary. Well, one boundary corresponds to x equals zero, and cotangent is infinity there. The other one corresponds to x equals l, and that means I need cotangent of k0l to diverge. Well, the next place where cotangent diverges is when k0l is equal to pi. So I just pick my k0 to be equal to pi divided by l, and then I'll get a divergence at the right-hand side of the box. All right, that then tells me what the energy is. I just substitute in what that k0 is being pi over l, and I'll get h bar squared pi squared over 2m l squared. And that's going to indeed be the energy for the ground state of the particle in a box. Now, let's try to get our first auxiliary Hamiltonian. Remember, it's just a cookbook. We interchange the order of the A0 and the A0 dagger, and we add our E0. And then that's what our H1 is. So now we have to do a calculation to figure out what that is. So the only thing that changes is the sign on the commutator. That goes from being a plus sign to a minus sign. But remember, the commutator gave me a minus cosecant squared. So now it's going to be a plus cosecant squared. And now I have to be a little bit clever here to think about how to get a good identity. What I want to do is I want to add 0 in such a way that I have a factor that will give me a minus h bar squared k0 squared cosecant squared plus h bar squared k0 squared cotangent squared because we know that minus cosecant squared plus cotangent squared is equal to minus 1. And so I'm going to add and subtract a minus h bar squared k0 squared cosecant squared k0x hat. That's going to change my plus h bar squared k0 squared cosecant squared to plus 2 of those. And then I'm going to get a constant that I have left over as well. That constant is minus h bar squared k0 squared over 2m. It's going to cancel the e0, which was h bar squared k0 squared over 2m. And so my potential ends up now being a potential that has a cosecant squared in it. All right, so now it seems like I'm in the soup. I have to now figure out how do I factorize a Hamiltonian with a cosecant squared potential. What kind of crazy thing is that? Who ordered that? Well, here's where we come into the rescue. And this is what happens with essentially all of the problems that we know how to solve with this method. They are what are called shape-preserving shape 
potentials or shape invariant potentials. And when you have a shape preserving or shape invariant potential, that means that we pick our lowering operator, our ladder operator, to have the exact same form as the one that we picked before. So look, the previous one ended up being p hat plus i h bar k0 cotangent k0 x hat. So here I'll just pick w1 equals cotangent k1 prime x hat. And I'm going to pick the k in front to be a k1. And we're going to just see, can we force this to work? So we have to calculate the a1, a1 dagger. And, you know, we've been doing this now, so we know that the commutator of the p hat with the cotangent is going to give me a minus cosecant squared. And with the way that it works, with the sign that I have there, it ends up being a plus h bar squared k1, k1 prime comes out when we take that commutator. And then the square is going to be an h bar squared k1 squared. Okay, now look at what our answer is. It has to equal cosecant squared plus a constant. And I've got this cotangent squared term. How, how do I deal with that? Well, I'm going to do the add and subtract zero again. I'm going to add an h bar squared k1 squared cosecant squared and subtract an h bar squared k1 squared cosecant squared. When I look at the minus cosecant squared plus cotangent squared, that equals one. That's going to give me a minus h bar squared k1 squared as a number. And then I have to add that h bar squared k1 squared cosecant squared to the first term. And I can just add those together and factorize. And we get h bar squared k1 k1 prime plus k1 cosecant squared minus h bar squared k1 squared. OK, I don't worry about the constant because I'm allowed to do the factorization up to a constant. And our constant is negative, so we're in good shape. We'll have a nice bound state. What I need to do is I need to pick k1 prime and k1 such that I have a cosecant squared k0 x hat. And I have a number in front that is equal to 2 because I'm dividing by 1 over 2m. So it turns out there are two choices I can make. I can pick k1 prime equals k0, and I can pick k1 equals k0 or k1 equals minus 2k0. Let's check that out. Obviously, picking k1 prime equals k0 is going to give me a cosecant squared k0x. I definitely need to do that. And if I substitute in k1 prime equals k0, I have k1 times k0 plus k1. All right, well, if I pick k1 equals k0, I'll get k0 times k0 plus k0. That's 2k0 squared. That's going to work. If I pick k1 equals minus 2k0, I get a minus 2k0 out front times a k0 minus 2k0. That's just a minus k0. The minus signs cancel, and I get a 2k0 squared as well. And because it's essentially quadratic in the k1, there always are two solutions. So now we have to look at each one of those solutions. If I pick k1 equals k0, what you find then is that the a1 is going to be p hat minus i h bar k0 cotangent. But look up at that a0. That means the a1 is equal to a0 dagger. Remember, that was one of our rules. We're not allowed to do that because if we do that, the chain just terminates at that point. So we're not allowed to pick k1 equals k0. We have to instead pick k1 equals minus 2k0. And that's our only choice that we have allowed. Now, I do want to just give one comment. You might have said, oh, look, that cosecant squared is, is it's an even function, and it's squared. So I could have picked k, k1 prime equals minus k0. And indeed, you could pick that. But you'll find that you end up with exactly the same ladder operators as we get by picking k1 prime equals plus k0. And so we're going to just pick the k1 prime equals plus k0 for what we're doing to simplify things and not have too many minus signs running around. OK, so then we have actually determined what our solution is. That has now solved our factorization of the a1. It becomes p hat plus 2 i h bar k0. You see it's a 2 instead of a 1 that we had for the a0. h1 is a1 dagger a1 plus e1. e1 ends up being, because it's a k1 squared, it ends up being 4 h bar squared k0 squared over 2m. And now we're ready to do it again. OK, let's calculate h2. So our second auxiliary Hamiltonian involves the opposite order. We've been through this a number of times. We know what the commutator is. When we calculate it, we're going to get a term that will have a 2 h bar squared 
k0 squared times the cosecant squared, and it's going to have a 4 h-bar squared k0 squared times the cotangent squared. We're going to use our same trick of adding and subtracting 4 h-bar squared k0 squared secant, cosecant squareds. The minus cosecant squared plus cotangent squared is equal to 1. That's going to give me a term that's equal to minus the e1. And then I'm going to have a 2 plus 4 as my coefficient of the cosecant squared, so it's going to be a 6. But remember, I'm dividing by 2m, so the 6 becomes a 3, and that's the origin of the term that's there. If this seems unclear to you, I do recommend that you pause the video, maybe go back a little bit in the video to see how we did the calculation when we we're calculating h1, and go through that algebra and make sure that you can get this. But now we go through the same procedure, okay? We're going to guess that it is equal to a p hat minus i h bar k2 cotangent k2 prime x hat. The algebra is exactly the same to what we did in the case with h1, so we can just write down what the answer is. I have a k2 times a k2 prime plus k2 and a cosecant squared k2 prime x. We're going to pick the k2 prime equals k0, and then the k2, there are two choices now. It's either 2k0 or minus 3k0. We see if we pick the 2k0 as the choice, we're going to be picking a2 equals a1 dagger, which is not allowed, so we can't do that. So instead, we pick the other choice. We pick k1 equals minus 3k0. That gives us our raising operator as plus 3i h bar k0, and our energy is 9 h bar squared k0 squared over 2m. I think you can see that we have a pattern developing. a0 was a 1 i h bar k0, a1 was a 2. A2 is a 3. I think you can pretty much guess that the An is going to be an N, and the energy ends up squaring that number, so our, our general energy should be N squared H bar squared K0 squared over 2M. And indeed, that is what happens. So the general result when we do the factorization, our Hn has an N times an N plus 1 times this H bar squared K0 squared over 2M times the cosecant squared. Our, our Lowering operator is p hat plus n plus 1 i h bar k0 cotangent. That should be, I'm sorry, that should be cotangent of k0x. And then hn is a n dagger a n plus e n. e n equals n plus 1 squared h bar squared k0 squared over 2m. Okay. The algebra to do this is really similar to what we've done before. You just have to keep in front of you the appropriate factors of n. I do recommend that you pause the video and go through it. Make sure that you can go through the steps because we're going to be doing similar problems on the homework, and you do need to be able to do this. And I do want to congratulate you. I do find this to be one of the harder problems to do because these factorizations and calculating these commutators and stuff, it's pretty hard stuff that you're trying to work on here. And so you have to really be careful with how you do these things. And it's really this abstraction and trying to figure out what the k values are for the next step that's really the hard thing. You've got this quadratic equation. You've got to look at all the different possibilities and so forth. There are easier ways to solve this problem, okay? The way that we did it when we solved particle on a circle, where we did a single factorization and we used the boundary condition to determine the allowed k values, that will work in this case as well. And if we do that, we will find that we get the solution to work much more easily than we do with this factorization chain. But it's very nice to know that we can construct this factorization chain, and it's not a trivial chain like we had with a simple harmonic oscillator. It's a more complicated one. Now, I don't believe there's any problem, other problem we're going to have to do in this class that is as painful as this one. So you've gotten through the worst already. What about Schrodinger? He's the first person to solve the problem this way. He called it shooting sparrows with artillery. And so here's a nice meme for you about shooting sparrows with artillery. And that is going to then conclude lecture four of module seven.